This is CBS Eye on the World. I'm John Batchelor, and it's a pleasure to speak of an, a book battle-tested with the author, Jeff McCausland, Colonel Jeff McCausland, United States Army, retired. He's at CBS News, but right now he's an author. Battle-tested is about Gettysburg leadership lessons from 1863 for 21st century leaders, and there are lessons in all directions. We now come to a conversation and a meeting of the minds between James Longstreet, the corps commander, a veteran corps commander. Of, they're all veterans of West Point in the, Ma- the Mexican War. And Robert E. Lee. And the question is, on the second day, having not overrun the Union forces on the first day, or through the night, the Union has arrived and created what is called a fish hook from Gettysburg south along Cemetery Ridge to Little and Big and Little Round Top. James Longstreet comes forward with an idea that the, the battle does not have to be decided by a frontal assault. It can be decided by maneuver. Jeff, uh, Longstreet's speech to Lee is convincing here in the 21st century. Would it have been convincing in the 19th century to avoid battle, place yourself between the enemy's uh, the enemy and the capital, and make them attack you. Would that have made sense in those days? Well, I think it would have, because if you look back, particularly at Fredericksburg, the Confederates had found they were most successful when on, they were on the defense and the Yankees were attacking them. So clearly, based on technology and maneuver and mobility and a number of things, it seemed like the defense has a, a certain number of advantages. So when Longstreet meets with Lee, of course, Lee suggests that we're going to attack them if they're at that place. That's what he would say. Uh, Longstreet replies, you know, Lee, if they're still there tomorrow, they want you to attack them at that place. But Lee still persists. And next morning, of course, he'll issue his orders uh, for that particular attack. So it's massive conjecture, again, that if they had followed Longstreet's advice, a Gettysburg would have been a one-day battle and a Confederate victory. But the more decisive battle would have been later as the Confederates tried to maneuver south of the Union Army head down towards Washington. The Yankees would have to follow them, find a good piece of terrain, occupy it, and then let the Yankees attack them. Well, in some ways, that sounds persuasive. Don't forget, one of the problems that Robert E. Lee had was Jeb Stewart is absent. Jeb Stewart, his his cavalry is missing, and they've been off on a long raid uh, and have lost contact with the main body. And to conduct the maneuver, I would argue that Longstreet was recommending uh, Lee was going to need that cavalry to screen the advance, screen the flank of the army so they weren't be attacked while in motion, identify the proper routes, the bridges, and et cetera, that they could use. And not having that cavalry there really made the maneuver that uh, Longstreet was recommending to swing around and, and try to threaten Washington difficult, if not impossible. The accusation against Longstreet is that he gets the slows and does not launch his attack till late in the day. But this is... Uh, I believe, an illustration of a commander, a boss, a leader, who does not get a buy-in from his subordinates. How does it work, Jeff? Well, I think that's very true. How it works is about 8 o'clock in the morning, the second day, Robert E. Lee will head down Seminary Ridge. He'll encounter Pete Longstreet, and he'll say, okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take your corps. I want you to maneuver down on the southern end of the battlefield, and I want want you to attack the left flank of the a Union Army, and hopefully we'll, we'll roll them up. Um, he then goes off, he, Lee, and he says, I want you to get in moving as soon as possible. He then goes off and goes around to the northern end of the battlefield to confer directly with Richard Ewell and perhaps give him a bit more direction than he had on the afternoon of day one. Lee will return about noon. He launches and says, well, you know, I'm still waiting for uh, some of my forces to arrive, and I don't want to go to, into battle with one boot off. That's an actual quote. But he actually gets underway. As they begin moving down the ridge line, they realize they could be seen by Union forces on Cemetery Ridge. And so they literally turn around, march all the way back up to the start point, march a little bit farther west, and then come around to get in position for the attack. So the attack that was in Lee's mind supposed to occur at around noon that day doesn't begin until about 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And as you pointed out a few moments ago, John, throughout the day, more and more Union forces are arriving. This is what we call in military parlance a meeting engagement as forces continue to arrive. And as they arrive, that fish hook it continues to extend farther and farther south, ultimately to the point where we have Union forces now uh, on Little Round Top at the very, very southern end of that Union line. The concern now is on the Union side. 
And now we move over to a decision that is uh, in, in many ways uh, in subordination. A man by the name of Vincent, um, a strong Vincent, is commanding a brigade, and he's given an order to re- to pass to his commander to reinforce the left flank, little to- little little round top and big round top, and he cannot find his commander. He's been ordered to march into Longstreet's combat in something called the Peach Orchard or the Wheat Field. However, he decides on his own that since he couldn't secure the left flank of the of the battlefield for the Union, he's going to do it himself. Jeff, this is an extraordinary moment. He has no permission from his commanders. He takes it entirely upon himself. And as you mentioned, if he hadn't been killed in the combat, he might have been court-martialed. It's, it's very possible. I mean, <clears throat> this is all created in part because of another Union general, Corps commander, the name of Dan Sickles, who's the only non-West Point Corps commander on either side, Extraordinary figure in his own right. He's a union general because he's a politician. And Abraham Lincoln uh, had realized one way to keep the Democrats in the war was make some Democrats generals. And Sickles was one who got the nod as a general officer. Sickles' Third Corps arrives on the southern end of the line. But uh, he thinks that there is better terrain forward of the line. So he advances his troops, as you suggest, John, to the wheat field and peach orchard. He does that without direction from Meade or even informing Meade, the overall commander. This places a bulge in the Union line and actually a gap between Sickles' uh, northern unit and the most southern unit uh, on his flank. And suddenly, of course, the Confederates attack, and he is decisively engaged. And that's when the General Sykes' division that Vincent is part of gets an order to reinforce reinforce that left flank, which is crumbling, which is Sickles. As Sickles, or as, as Strong Vincent, I'm sorry, is advancing with his brigade, his orders to go to the wheat field, he intercepts a courier, which is a messenger. And the messenger is from uh, a gentleman by the name of Governor Warren. And Governor Warren is the engineer officer for the entire Army of the Potomac, a brigadier general, who has no command authority. He is a staff officer to advise the commander, General Meade. But he has gone up on Little Round Top, realizes this is really key terrain, and there's nobody up here but a few signal, signal soldiers, and sends a messenger trying to find General you know, Sykes, recommending, urging him to put troops on the Round Top. Nobody can find Sykes, and to this day, and I've done research, I still can't figure out where Sykes was. But he does run into strong Vincent. Vincent says, you have orders. He reads the message, realizes that this is not a directive because it can't be but makes a quick assessment of the situation and does realize this is the critical terrain, Little Round Top. And even though my orders tell me to go someplace else, he immediately, as you suggest, disobeys the orders he has, demonstrates clear initiative, and orders his troops up onto a Little Round Top, his three brigades, one of which commanded, of course, by the rather famous uh, Joshua Chamberlain of the, of the 20th Maine. And if, I am totally convinced, had Vincent not done that, the Confederates would have overrun a little round top, compromised the Union line, and Gettysburg would have been a two-day battle and a Confederate victory. The action on little round top and big round top are notable, but we're going to move on to General Meade, because at the end of the second day, General Meade, who's only commanded the Army of the Potomac for a few weeks now, since uh, Hooker was relieved of duty by uh, the President of the United States, Meade is not a Lee-style commander. Meade likes to confer with his subordinates, and there's a meeting in his headquarters in which the junior and senior commanders all participate. The the uh, recollection is from one particular participant, John Gibbon. What about Meade's style is useful here in the 21st century, Jeff? Well, I think it's fascinating to contrast Meade's style to Robert E. Lee as well. I mean, these two guys are in totally different positions in terms of being a leader. Robert E. Lee has been in in command for 16 months. He's been very, very successful. He was widely known in the Federal Army, was famous, was offered command of the uh, Union Army at the onset of the Civil War and turned it down to return to the Confederacy. So he's really kind of a rock star. He's kind of an icon. Uh, Meade is uh, placed in command of the Army of the Potomac two days before the battle. He receives the the, uh, directive from the president on the 28th of June when he's woken up in the middle of the night and told he's, he's now in command. So he's a, he's a rookie. He's just now in command, and he suddenly realized he's been elevated from being a corps commander, and he's leading his peer group. 
and a number of the people that he is leading, none of the other generals, a couple of them actually outrank him by his day of rank. I'm sure a number of them thought they were a whole lot smarter than Meade. So Meade's in a very different position vis-a-vis uh, his immediate followers. And as a consequence, I think he has to build a certain amount of consensus. You know, we like to use, John, in the book, a definition of leadership provided by Dwight Eisenhower, that leadership's about deciding what has to be done and then getting others to want to do it. And so Meade takes the time that evening to have the meeting you described to try to build consensus, uh, which he does for the Union Army to defend on the third day. Now, frankly, from some of the things he had written, and I've talked to a number of historians, I'm pretty well convinced that's what Meade was going to do anyway. But he felt a need to build that consensus, particularly because he was new in command. It's interesting to contrast that again to Robert E. Lee on that fateful night, one of the most fateful nights, I think, in American history. Uh, Lee doesn't see hardly anybody. He goes to his headquarters. He contemplates his plans to himself, keeps his own counsel in determining uh, what he's going to do. Uh, And he couldn't uh, contrast this differently than what uh, Meade does. Meade actually considers three alternatives to his generals. Should we stay? Should we retreat? Or should we actually attack the Confederates on the third day? And as you suggest, they actually vote on this, beginning with the most junior officer, moving up to the most senior, so the juniors would not be intimidated by those who outrank them. And they decide, we will stay and defend on the third day. The third day of the battle. Battle tested. Gettysburg leadership lessons for 21st century leaders. Jeff McCausland, Colonel Jeff McCausland, United States Army, retired, is the author. This is CBS Eye on the World. I'm John Batch. Stay tuned for more of CBS Eye on the World with John Batchelor. 